Hi, and welcome to this live reading from Antipodes by T.S. Simons, and this is presented by Itsy Bitsy Book Bits. My head was throbbing. A piercing stream of white light with dancing flecks of dust struck me full in the eye as I dared crack one open, forcing me to curl into the fetal position under the blankets to avoid its harsh interrogation. Knowing that to get up and close the curtain would wake me further, I stubbornly refused to acquiesce, desperate for a few more hours of oblivion. The low drone was relentless, reverberating through my skull. Rolling over, I groaned as I recognized the sound. Someone was vacuuming a particularly dirty section of the hallway rug that appeared to be right outside my bedroom door. Sighing, I recognized the masterful handiwork of my mother. Mom derived a perverse sense of pleasure in torturing me when I was sick, particularly if it was of the self-inflicted variety. The subterranean growl I thought I had heard as I had tried to stealthily sneak in at 3 a.m. and tripped over the cat clearly meant that I had indeed woken her when I had fallen with full force into the hallway wall. Merlin had gleefully recognized someone being awake as breakfast time and had started yowling at the top of his lungs. That cat had no off switch. My choices at that point had been limited. Clatter around the kitchen and feed him or have him follow me to bed, purring like a chainsaw, walking on my belly, pushing random items off the chest of drawers until I succumbed. Like all rescue cats, Merlin considered himself a black furry god. Shuffling around the kitchen in the dark, I opened the noisy pasta can. Wafts of tuna atop a belly full of beer and kebab made me gag, so I bolted. Loud rumbles of content echoed as I shuffled up the hallway, trying not to wake my family further in that exaggerated way one does when extremely intoxicated. Thus, the excruciatingly loud vacuuming at stupid o'clock on a Sunday morning a quick glance at my watch while still trying to avoid the light from my window told me that it was 8.05 a.m. indicated that Mum was not impressed at being woken. Ten minutes later, and Mum still hadn't managed to dislodge that stubborn bit of dirt from outside my room. I recognized the futility in avoiding my fate. Mum had been born and raised in a small community on Lewis, a remote island in the Outer Hybrids, off the northwest coast of Scotland. The determined Scots streak in her had never waned despite living here for more than 20 years after she met my Scots-born Australian-raised dad while he was backpacking and visiting his own relatives in Scotland. Mum had readily admitted that at the time she was desperate to escape her small island, small town existence. The occasional subtle dig from my father indicated that Mum had been a wild child, and left some carnage in her wake before she met Dad and moved to Australia. Small-town living was clearly not suited to her. When we were young, Mom had returned to university and completed her teaching degree. Now a principal, I had no doubt that the kids at her primary school were absolutely shit-scared of her. Despite her heart of gold and inability to walk past a person, child, or animal in need, she still hadn't lost the sharp accent exurbit wit, nor the ability to reduce a fool stupid enough to take her on to a withered mass within minutes. If eyes were the window to the soul, they also expressed a spectrum of emotions. Mum possessed an arsenal of rather creative tactics to express her displeasure. Nothing as mundane as yelling, as there is no torture worse than lying in bed trying to decide whether to get up and go to the loo or to continue to lie there trying to sleep, but desperately needing to pee. I finally got up. Morning, Mom chirped over the vacuum's roar as I staggered past, misjudged the corner, banged my elbow, and finally closed the door to the bathroom firmly behind me. Dropping my head, I groaned loudly, my long fringe falling across my face. Torture tactic number two had commenced. Excessive chirpiness went until I told her where I was last night, who I was with, and what I did. At least she had turned the vacuum off. What ye up to, Campbell, me lad? 
The prying questions continued as I shuffled from the bathroom to the kitchen, analgesic in hand. Trying to respond, but unable to dislodge the dry furry throat without a drink, I ended up grunting a monosyllabic response in her general direction that came out remotely like the desired word, sleep. My sister, Sorsha, was sitting on the banquette, sit seating at the dining table. Her back to the window, she had a cup of coffee in hand and an empty cereal bowl to the right of the newspaper she was reading. Despite paying bills, shopping, and performing more, most day-to-day -day transactions online, my parents were old school in that they still liked having the weekend paper delivered. Facing the kitchen door where I had entered, my sister was engrossed in the paper and barely registered my existence. We had never been close, uh, not since we were young. Contemplating making a cooked breakfast to settle my throbbing head and queasy stomach, I realized that I would need to clean up afterwards. Instead, I settled for toast and coffee. The coffee machine whirred as it ground the beans, and I cringed as, as the noise pierced my skull, making me clutch my head, grimacing in pain. Filling a glass of water from the tap, I gazed blearily at the painkillers in my hand, wishing they could alleviate the, the pain by osmosis as I waited for the toaster. Funny how two tiny white tablets could ease so much. Tilting my head back, I dropped them into the back of my throat, washing them down with a gulp of the water. Cup and plate in hand, I finally plonked myself down at the table in one of the chairs opposite Sorsha. Toast and coffee should be granted official medicinal status, I thought absolutely. There is absolutely no situation that cannot be improved with the addition of hot buttery toast and strong coffee. Where's Dad? I asked Sorsha between mouthfuls, the coffee starting to revive me into some semblance of humanity. She wrinkled her nose at the interruption but responded without glancing up. The block. Dad had always loved taking us camp camping. Dad was a different push person in the bush. He just blended in. It was like Dad fit somehow, evolving into something different. Dad loved it all, fishing, cooking on open fires, hiking in the mountains, and he had loved teaching us how to be self-sufficient. For years, he had refused to own a smartphone, responding with, Smartphone, dumb user. Nothing could be further from the truth. He had an immense knowledge of medicine, history, and obscure topics that made him an interesting man to talk to. Many times I had wondered why he had chosen a career as a paramedic in the city when he was so clearly better suited to farming or rural life even a career in academia. Dad had immense knowledge and interest in World War I history and had allegedly dragged Mum all over Europe to see historical sites like the Menin Gate and the Somme and Villers Bertrandot on their honeymoon. Despite sharing his love of history, Mum's particular area of interest being Celtic and Pict archaeology, Mum was a city creature. She loved shops, cinemas, and people. Mom couldn't stop by the supermarket to buy milk without striking up a conversation with a stranger about some arbitrary topic. Shopping with her was a veritable nightmare as she would try to draw you into the conversation, and you ended up being forced to share highly embarrassing anecdotes from your ch childhood. I had started to refuse to shop with her when she regressed to chatting to old people who adopted her as a kindred spirit in the pet food aisle. That whole section between cat food and laundry liquid was a quagmire best avoided. Most years, Mum would invite strays to join us at Christmas dinner. Random people. Those new to the city with no family. Homeless people that she harassed into coming along. Goodness knows where she found them. Probably buying cat food with a solitary lean cuisine in their trolley, the beacon of a lone dweller. Mum could spot a lonely person a mile off. Mum was the type of person who, if you arrived during dinner, she would take a small portion from everyone's plate until she could feed you, too. Refusing to get rid of old coats, every year Mum would run a collection donating winter jackets to those in need. Warm, caring, cajoling, or blatantly manipulative, Mum had a way of getting what she wanted. But people loved her and said she had a heart of gold. My pounding head, eardrums still vibrating from vacuum cleaner noise, wasn't convinced. 
Sorsha, three years older than I and now in her final year of a postgraduate medical degree and working part-time as a university tutor, claimed she didn't have time to go camping anymore. But the truth is she had never really enjoyed it. She only went as she wanted to please Dad. I had long suspected that he had always known that, but being the eternal diplomat never said a word. He welcomed her and enjoyed her company. He just nodded sagely when she finally plucked up the courage to tell him that she didn't want to spend her weekends out at our bush block anymore. The block, as we had called it from the time my parents had bought it 12 years ago, was five acres of blue gum and candle bark trees, just over three hours' drive from our Melbourne home, quite literally in the middle of nowhere on the back road to Mount Bueller. We had debated names for hours, arguing over the merits of each, but couldn't reach a consensus. Mum finally ended the debate by stating that the property would name itself, and the name would become apparent when it was time. It hadn't. Now it was just too embarrassing to try. I had long suspected that no one else wanted this particular piece of bushland when my parents had bought it dead cheap at the end of a dirt track over a kilometer off the nearest road and surrounded by state forest. I was 11 when they had bought it, old enough to roam the forest for hours on a trail bike during my school holidays and long weekends, making slingshots, climbing trees, and enjoying bushfires at night with toasted marshmallows. For Dad, it was his nirvana, and he loved being there like nowhere else on earth. Despite all the years we had owned it, the block was still mostly covered in bush with a small two-room cottage we had built from scratch. Surrounded by a forest of eucalypts with soaring tree ferns, bracken, and ground cover, over the past few years, Dad had begun more clearing and had started planting a mixed orchard as well as a decent-sized vegetable patch. He was still working out what grew well and what didn't. Keeping the local wildlife from snacking was an ongoing issue, requiring creative fencing solutions. Wallabies, wombats, and koalas, even deer, regularly came to help themselves to dinner. The possums got most of the cherries, even with sheets of metal clad around the trunks to hinder their climbing. So after two seasons of failure, he finally gave up with them, letting the possums have them. There was no point in ripping them out, after all. Stone fruit grew well, but he simply couldn't get lemons to grow. Finally, Mum had said acerbically, "Ye couldn't bought a lot of lemons with the money you spent on citrus trees, ye can. Dad had rolled his eyes and said nothing, but I noted that he stuck to stone fruit after that. Unable to describe why, but I loved it there so much. Like Dad, I felt a bond, a connection. The peace of the bush, the sounds of lyrebirds singing, calling, the wind in the trees. I always felt a lingering sense of sadness when I left. Seated at the kitchen table, food in my stomach, I pondered what to do with my Sunday. My head was still throbbing from adventures the previous night when I had celebrated my 23rd birthday with my agricultural science friends from Melbourne University. Although I wasn't a huge fan of noisy clubs, I knew that I needed to do what normal people did, and so went along with the plan. I was in my honors year now and contemplating what to do next. Look for a job, post-grad study, or my usual course of action, wait and see what landed in my lap. We had been back at university for a week, and I had enjoyed catching up with friends and acquaintances after the summer holidays before knuckling down to my thesis. Most of us had jobs to help fund the reality of tertiary study. I considered myself lucky that I still lived at home and didn't pay rent or bills, but working part-time at a wholesale plant nursery helped provide a much-needed source of disposable income, plus a staff discount that Dad regularly put to good use. Working with plants was therapeutic, and I was one of the reasons I was seriously contemplating a career in global food security, despite not really knowing how to make that idea a reality. Time for those decisions in a few months. Last night there had been copious amounts of alcohol consumed in the obligatory late-night kebab on my way home. Glancing down at my empty coffee cup, I pondered the merits of a second. Sorsha looked up from the newspaper, belatedly acknowledging my existence, and asked if I had seen the news. My general policy was to avoid the news, as I found it highly political and thus boring. Shaking my head in neg negation, I threw where this was. I knew where this was going. She had the look. The, the derisive way her eyes narrowed and nostrils flared indicated she was about to launch into yet another monotonous academic lecture about the merits of some obscure scientific theory, spotlighting her vast medical training while simultaneously proving beyond doubt to the world at large that I was a complete moron. To my surprise, instead of lecturing me, Sorsha folded back the paper to expose the front page. A large headline loomed at me. Unknown virus kills hundreds. 
Squinting through my headache, I scanned the slightly blurred first paragraph. An unknown epidemic was spreading across several countries in Europe, killing people, animals, aquatic life, and plants. Continued on page three. Looking up, I shrugged at her. So? Don't you get it? She sneered, unable to contain her incredulousness. In the space of 15 seconds, I had proven myself to be the cretin she had evidently believed I was. You do study biology, right? Remind me to have a chat with Carter about reviewing your grades. Well, clearly not to the same level as you, Dr. Macintosh, I retorted. Planning to enlighten me? Rolling her eyes in exaggerated exa exasperation, she adopted the tone one uses when speaking to a child or an idiot. Both in this case, apparently. I wondered if she talked to her recalcitrant students like this, doubting it would have much effect on them either. The virus is in the water, she explained very slowly so the stupid among us could catch on. Okay, I replied hesitantly. So? <laughs> it is spreading, Sorcha sniped caustically. Rapidly. Okay, but it's in Europe, I countered sarcastically. Not exactly next door. Surely it can be contained. That is precisely the problem. How do you contain something in waterways? The World Health Organization is saying that it started at the Danube and within a few weeks is killing people all over Europe. Did you not learn about Brownian motion in school? You know, particles suspended in liquid spread and move randomly? Sure, but then it dilutes, right? Well, that is where this one is different. This epidemic, they are calling it the Vienna virus, by the way, because that is where the first known death occurred, seems to multiply, and scientists yet can't work out how. There are hundreds of people dead already, and many more than that have infected. None of them survive once infected. Desperately wanting to needle her, I really didn't have the energy. Look, I, I get that I need to read the article, but tell me the basics. I mean, we have survived swine flu, avian flu, SARS. How bad is it really? I asked this time more kindly. Glancing back at the paper, she read, 2,850 kilometers of waterways and, cross and crosses 11 countries. If it spreads into all of those countries, waterways, and eventually into the ocean, it will end up in the Black Sea. Well, that isn't too bad, is it? I countered, my limited geographical knowledge kicking in. Isn't the Black Sea the one that is fully contained? Nope. The Black Sea is nav navigable to the Atlantic Ocean. Oh... The word came out like a deflating tire. I really had nothing to say to that. I sat and looked at Sorsha, dumbfounded. Some critics are saying this is Malthusian theory and practice. Scratching my still aching temple, I tried to recall who Malthus was, not wanting to appear a bigger idiot in front of my judgmental sister. That was the guy that said that the population tends to increase at a faster rate than its ability to feed itself, right? That's him. He also said that unless the population is kept in check by moral restraint like celibacy or by disease, famine, war, or natural disaster, then the population will continue to experience widespread poverty and would never achieve utopia. Happy bloke, I commented cheer cheerily. Must have been great fun at dinner parties. The door to the kitchen opened and Mum backed in, dragging the vacuum behind her. As she turned it on and it roared into life, this effectively prevented any further conversation. Sorcia returned to her newspaper, and I decided a second cup of coffee was warranted, and the noise no longer an impediment. Going back to bed wasn't really an option, nor was continuing to endure Mum's interrogation. Years of experience told me that she was by no means finished with me. Mum finished up the floors in the kitchen as I was steaming the milk. Wiping down the machine after years of being nagged into cleaning up as I went, I watched Mum move into the lounge room, and I firmly closed the door behind her, sitting down with my now full steaming cup and placing the second in front of Sorsha. She looked at me with surprise but smiled her thanks. Sorsha and I sat in silence for several more minutes before she looked up again. Well, are you going? Going? Where? Another loud and overly exaggerated sigh responded before pushing the paper in front of me, a half-page advertisement. My head still hurt, and I couldn't focus my eyes on the slightly blurred fine print, so I pushed it back. Call me stupid. Summarize it for me. Sorcia rolled her eyes. This is everywhere. Papers, TV, email, through the university faculty. 
I must have received it six times already. Don't you have a phone? Check your email? Light bulb went off in my head. Remembering that my phone had gone flat the night, the previous night, I stood and picked it up from the bench where I had dropped it with my wallet and keys the night before and plugged it in. Within seconds, the distinct pinging sounds of messages, email, and SMS were reverberating around the kitchen. Just tell me, I wheezed with exaggerated drama as I fell back into the chair opposite Sorsha. Sorsha took a deep breath and read, It is an official announcement. Commonwealth Department of Innovation and Science. They are seeking people to attend a briefing at their main site in Melbourne. Very specific skills. Set age ranges. You need to register online. Misreading the cues, I asked. Do you want to go together? I'm busy, she snapped. I have a class to teach at 9 o'clock. You don't have classes until the afternoon, so you should go and see what it is all about. You meet the criteria. Well, apart from the not being an idiot part, which they neglected to mention as a deal breaker. So, so you go, and then you can call me. There are multiple session times anyway. I will go to the evening one if it isn't wasting my time. Ignoring her taunt, I clicked on the link in one of the countless messages registering my expression of interest. An automated re reply pinged back, noting my booking for a bus departing the university campus at 8.30 a.m. Excellent. I could go and be back in time for my afternoon class. <laughs>